Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I, it's, it's very much a pleasure for me to be here and, and, and talk with you. I, I was here last November, I guess it was, and we, we talked a little bit about um, hypothesis generating studies. Um, and and this, this will be a lot different. I want it to be very much of a conversation. Um, I uh, am, am young, uh, but I have had some experience being both a mentee and a mentor. And I think that um, there are many ways uh, to have a mentee-mentor relationship. And just having those discussions is important uh, so that we learn from each other uh, ways in which we can improve on, on that relationship. And so uh, the way that I thought I'd structure this is maybe you know, 30, 45 minutes of me sharing some of my thoughts. But uh, by all means, I'm not here to just lecture you. If you have things you want to say or ask me about, please feel free uh, during that time. But after, after that, I thought we would get together in maybe two groups uh, and, and talk amongst each other about uh, an article, I think, uh, which has been sent down, which is called uh, Mentorship Malpractice. Did, did everyone read the, uh, the article? Okay. So I, I, I thought when I read that, it was a very interesting article to me. Um, many ways, not because I necessarily recognized acts of malpractice amongst my mentors, but I even recognized things there that I might have been guilty of myself. So I think that we can uh, use that framework that's presented in that very short piece um, to talk about um, maybe some of our past experiences, but more importantly, how do we overcome certain types of relationships that we may come across. Um, because we're all very much human beings. Um, so, uh, before I begin, are there any any questions or comments? So I've titled the talk, uh, It's Not Easy Being Green. So, anyone know where that comes from? Who famously said, said it's not easy being green? You, Kermit the Frog, who said that? <laughs> so, so this is Kermit. Um, Kermit, I, Kermit was probably saying this in the mid 1980s. Um, uh, oh, and so uh, it's not easy being green. I think that we think of mentees as being green, right? Uh, they are these tender sprouts in need of fertilization and watering and gentle nurturing. This is the name of the program: is nurture, right? Uh, so that the mentor is seen as this person who uh, is, is watering or nurturing them. But in fact, uh, there, are, there are many ways in which mentors may feel very green themselves. Uh, and so we have to understand that uh, growing as a mentee uh, is, is done in parallel with growing as a mentor. So your mentors that you may have now are learning how to be good mentors, even the ones that are, are older. So, so keep that in mind as, as we think about this relationship. So this, is, this was, I, you know, this is not my quote, this comes from the article. Uh, the article that I, that I asked you to read started with this. Does anyone remember who, who this quote is from? The delicate balance of mentoring someone is not creating them in your own image, but giving them the opportunity to create themselves. This is Steven Spielberg. Yeah, and, and I think that that's really key. So the role of a mentor is not for them to shape the mentee in their own image, but rather to help the mentee grow into something uh, that, that they want to become. So uh, again, I'm not a, an educator. Uh, I, I'm uh, not someone who's here to tell you exactly uh, what a mentee should be or what a mentor should be, but I think rather what I want to do today is tell you my own personal story and through that tell you some of the lessons learned uh, along the way. And certainly uh, I hope uh, you know my career is not nearing an end uh, because I am still young and I hope to grow in many ways as a mentor going forward. So uh, I'll start with uh, being a medical student. So I think that learning about the mentee-mentor relationship, and, and many of you are, are well past your, your medical school days, but think about 
your medical school days and think about the relationships you had as I share mine. Uh, I went to Ohio State. It's the Ohio State Buckeyes. Anyone ever heard of our football team? Pretty good football team. American football. Uh, in Central Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. It's one of the largest universities uh, in the country. And uh, I, I entered uh, medical school in 2002. So uh, when I entered, uh, I wasn't sure uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, so I was just this blank slate. And very early on in medical school, uh, I had an experience that shaped me very much to who I am today. And that is an experience in Swaziland between my first and second year of medical school, there was a group of us from Ohio State that traveled to Swaziland, and I, I was placed in, uh, in an internship with UNAIDS. And so, you may remember what the HIV epidemic was like in 2002 and 2003, especially in Southern Africa. Uh, and so this was a very impactful experience for me, uh, and shaped uh, much of uh, what I wanted to do with my life uh, going forward. Um, so, I thought I loved HIV, I loved my experience there, I, I was very much in love with HIV medicine, I, I thought as a second year medical school student, maybe I would do something in infectious disease or HIV. But then I met one of my first important mentors, uh, who was this guy, Charlie Bush, and, and I think that in many ways he uh, exemplifies someone who we typically think of as a mentor. So he was what I would call a master clinician. Do you use that term? We have, at our uh, uh, medical school, we designate this award to master clinicians who are these uh, senior professors who have so much experience that they can just talk and you just, all the students are enthralled and listen to, to their every word. Um, he was one of those. Uh, had so much clinical knowledge um, and not only clinical knowledge, but judgment. Um, seemed like, you know, in any clinical situation, he would know the right thing to do. Um, so I think the, the characteristics of a good mentor do include knowledge. You know, people who have just huge funds of knowledge, but also who have good judgment. So think about this when you think about who makes a good mentor. But then, um, even in medical school, I, I began to learn lessons that you're never too young to learn how to be a leader, or how to be uh, maybe a mentor yourself, and, and this is American Medical Student Association, or AMSA, was an opportunity for me as a medical student to learn how to lead, how to uh, uh, maybe mentor younger students, uh, and I think that's important as you start to develop relationships with people, that students that you may be men mentoring, that you encourage them to think about what, even though they're young, what opportunities do they have to gain leadership skills. Um, and, and so, <clears throat> um, very important. I think that um, one of the other key uh, uh, events that shaped the direction that my research career would take, besides this experience in Swaziland, was a very simple thing. So I had fallen in love with Charlie Bush, sorry I didn't mention maybe, that he's a cardiologist. So I had fallen in love in my second year with cardiology and I had this HIV interest in cardiology, but how were those two ever going to be uh, related at all to one another? Well, this is Priscilla Shu in that, in that photograph, who is a cardiologist at San Francisco. And uh, I happened to, this was back in the early days of webinars, right, in 2004. I just was like searching online one day, I came across this webinar from Croy, for those of you who do HIV work, the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, had a session in 2000, I think it was 2004 or so, uh, 2003, 2004, uh, where they were talking about heart disease and people living with HIV. This is soon after, you know, the first epidemiologic studies came out showing this relationship between chronic <coughs> HIV infection and, and the drugs, the early ART treatments, and myocardial infarction. So I was like, hey, this is it. This is where um, I can marry these two interests, HIV and cardiology. So the lesson I learned here, uh, which is I think an important lesson for how to be a good mentee, is to take initiative. Uh, so basically what I did is I just emailed her, 
and said, look, I, I want to do what you're doing. Uh, can I come work for you uh, in San Francisco? And so in my fourth year of medical school uh, at Ohio State, I traveled out to San Francisco uh, and was able to work with her for, uh, for a month. Now, uh, you have to encourage your medical students or those that you're men mentoring uh, to take initiative. But as a mentor, you also have to have the ability, uh, because you're going to be getting requests to work with you all the time, to say, who do I say yes to and who do I say no to? Um, and, and so I'm sure that Priscilla had to, had to do that with me. Um, and she, uh, very thankful, took a chance. Uh, and uh, it was a start of a, a very good relationship. Uh, but, but again, two lessons. It's important to take initiative. Uh, but then it's also important to be able to decide what, how to say no. Um, and so <clears throat> I ended up getting into residency at UCSF uh, in 2006. I graduated medical school and then traveled to San Francisco um, uh, where my wife was also doing a PhD in nursing uh, and started a three-year residency in internal medicine. So many of you who do HIV work uh, may know that UCSF clearly is a big HIV center. Uh, but when I went there, although I was interested in the clinical care of patients, people living with HIV who had cardiovascular disease, I wasn't sure really whether I would have a research career or whether I would be primarily a clinician or maybe a clinician educator. So I was still a little bit undifferentiated. So um, a couple of the experiences that helped me uh, to differentiate uh, was a program called PRIME, uh, which was uh, a track within the internal medicine residency, um, primarily at the VA, where we had some more experience with outcomes research and clinical uh, research. And my mentor there was Mike Schlipak. He's a guy who does kidney uh, disease research in large cohort studies. He's had uh, several New England Journal articles on biomarkers like Cystatin-C um, and uh, the prognostic value of, of chronic kidney disease. So uh, he was, he taught me many things. And I think from a research standpoint, he was my first true research mentor. And the thing that I think was most important that he taught me is about writing. And so uh, this is very key, I think, when you think about who, uh, who are you going to select as your mentor. Um, and, and if you have a mentor who's maybe not good at this, trying to find another mentor who is, uh, look for someone who is very good at writing, who can critique your papers, uh, and who is very uh, honest and uh, willing to critique you uh, on, on your papers. So I remember the first uh, manuscript that I ever wrote, which was eventually accepted for publication, was with, was with Mike Schlipak. And every time that I would take him a draft, it would come back almost completely redlined, like, <laughs> completely. So, so this was extremely important for him to be tough, but yet uh, committed, right? So, so he would go through all of those corrections with me and explain why you never start a sentence with this or how, you know, parallel structure, you have to do it this way, all sorts of things. So uh, very, very important to learn how to write well. I had another experience then, uh, again, I was interested in HIV and cardiology and global health. Uh, so uh, I was just hanging out in the Echo Lab, uh, and UCSF had this, and I think they probably still do, had this program where residents came here to Malago Hospital on a monthly basis, and, um, and this was back in 2008. Uh, I was interested in doing that, but I wanted to do something that was more than just, you know, a clinical experience. And so I was asking, maybe we could do a research project, and I was talking to Elise Foster, who was the head of the Echo Lab, shown there, and she helped me come up with a research question. Now, um, Elise Foster was not that close of a mentor for me during this eventual experience in which I uh, brought an ultrasound machine to uh, Malaga Hospital here and presented to the uh, Department of OBGYN and conducted a small study cross-sectional study of women, pregnant women, with HIV and without HIV, looking at echo parameters and asking the question, does the hemodynamic stress of pregnancy bring out underlying signs of cardiomyopathy in the HIV group compared to the controls? 
she helped me come up with that question, but then I needed someone to operationalize it. So many of you may know Charles Mondo. He was very, very instrumental in helping me to operationalize the research. Now he was not actually, honestly, that uh, involved in the actual construction of the research question, but, but he, he knew how to operationalize what I wanted to do. So the, having the combination of Elise Foster, who had the interesting question, who helped me formulate the question, and Dr. Mondo, who helped me operationalize it, was, was a useful partnership. So I think that when you think about your mentors, if you have someone who's good at one thing but maybe not another, you need to find someone who can, who can uh, provide those extra skills, right? Um, and so then I was, uh, I did this in my third year of residency and um, as I started looking for cardiology fellowships around the country, um, you know, one of the important questions that I had to ask was who at the place wherever I choose to go, who will be my mentor? And so uh, I, had to, I had to do my interviews with that in mind. And, and so one of those guys that I interviewed with is Dan Simon. So, uh, Another very important mentor to me. So he uh, is an interventional cardiologist who trained and practiced at the Brigham, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in, in Boston, Harvard professor, very young, dynamic guy who was you know, the rising star, came to Cleveland University Hospitals in 2006. And I was interviewing for fellowship in 2008. So when I was going around the interview trail and I said, I'm a cardiologist, I want to study HIV infection. I think almost 95% of everybody that I told that to looked at me cross-eyed and said, that doesn't make any sense, why would you want to do that? But Dan uh, was the one, one of the people that said, you know, I, I believe you, I think your question is interesting, I want to invest in you. So, so the important trait of a mentor there is that they believed in my vision, right? And they wanted not to form me in some uh, idea of what they had in mind, of what I should be, but rather wanted to help realize my vision. So I chose to come to Case Western University Hospitals primarily because of Dan Simon. So uh, he now, he became the president of the Heart Vascular Institute, is now the, the, uh, the president of uh, Cleveland Medical Center, uh, and has risen very much uh, in, in the ranks, uh, uh, and, and has been a mentor to many, many others as well. Uh, but Dan didn't study HIV infection, so he couldn't really be my mentor. So he was able to connect me with infectious disease specialists who did study things like the metabolic complications of HIV infection. And Grace McComsey is one of those people at, at UH and Case Western uh, who is well known in the field now uh, for describing the metabolic complications of HIV and treated HIV infection. So um, Grace became my primary mentor throughout the rest of my cardiology fellowship, uh, and we, uh, we published a lot together. The lesson I learned from Grace uh, is that uh, the best mentee-mentor relationship uh, has to be a two-way street. Uh, there is benefit both to the mentee, clearly the mentor is helping the mentee realize their dream, but the mentee is also helping the mentor in many ways, right? Um, as a mentor, you can, um, uh, having mentees who are effective can help you complete your research agenda, can, can extend the recent reach of your, of your findings, can help you come up with better ideas. Um, and so I provided that, Grace and I had that sort of relationship. You know, as a cardiology person, I had some expertise, and I said, why don't we do this? Or um, I was like, why don't I learn how to do this new technique, and we can apply that to this research question. Um, and that was that was uh, very meaningful for our relationship. Um, she also, I think, had a very important trait of a mentor, and that is that they provided uh, not just guidance, but concrete opportunities, right? So she had a project, this is what I need you to do, and allowed me to, to just do it and then get productivity out of that, right? So uh, we pub we've published a lot together. Uh, that is important, as you all know, for the advancement throughout academic medicine. All right. So then, uh, 2011, 
Um, the opportunity uh, came for uh, a group of us from Case Western, and this was actually, I, I had come to Uganda through UCSF, but I had gone to university hospitals not only because of Dan Simon, but because they also had a long-standing relationship with Uganda, and I thought maybe I would have the opportunity to come back here. And the opportunity came in 2011 when uh, the cardiovascular uh, uh, supplement for the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, the LINKED Award, was given to Uganda. Zimbabwe was the other country that received this award. And we, uh, from Case Western, were invited to help with the mentoring um, and the conduct of a large epidemiology study of cardiovascular risk factors. And Moses Kamio uh, was someone I met then, uh, in 2011, who has uh, remained a, you know, a very important colleague uh, and in many ways a uh, mentor, even though we don't interact a lot. <coughs> I have very much valued his uh, approach to leadership, which I think I would just summarize as being uh, very gracious and collaborative. So I think that uh, when you think about mentors, uh, you want people who will help connect you to networks. Uh, and I think Moses is one of these uh, people, uh, Professor Kami, I should say, uh, is one of these people who has uh, an extensive network who can, as a mentor, connect you uh, to other people in his network. Um, and so uh, then, at the, in the waning days of my cardiology fellowship, um, I decided to do to extend my training to do an extra year on what's called a T32 a training fellowship. And I think uh, for career development, it is important for you to think about what sorts of uh, uh, substantial experiences, like taking an entire year to do something intense with a, a mentor uh, on a project, how can those things help you to realize your vision? So I worked with Grace to do a T32 year. I was more productive, published more, which then allowed me to uh, uh, gain funding that would help uh, my early career. So uh, I talked a little bit about uh, you know having a vision, right? And so my vision was to be this specialist in um, cardiovascular risk among people living with HIV. Uh, and to do that, my vision was to create a clinic where I would see people living with HIV in the HIV clinic in the HIV medical home. But I would be a cardiologist, and I would see them for their cardiovascular problems, or maybe if they had high risk difficult to control hypertension, difficult to control lipids, that I could then uh, be the consultant that would help manage that together with their primary HIV doc. And so uh, this was kind of an unusual idea uh, because in the United States you may or may not know this, that uh, everybody has their fiefdom, uh, their silo, cardiology generates money. Uh, if you are a cardiologist, you work in a cardiology clinic and you generate money for the cardiology program. If you're an infectious disease doc, you work in the Division of Infectious Disease and generate money for them. So I was asking essentially, <laughs> cardiology, do you mind if I go work for infectious disease? And so uh, that required, uh, it wasn't something that I could just do as a young person, just say, I'm going to do this. You need to have the support of the administration. And so Bob Salata was the chair, uh, or was the chief of ID at the time, later has become now our current chair of medicine. Some of you may or may not know him, he has been coming to Uganda for over 25 years. Um, and, and he was very supportive of that vision. Um, again, another example of someone who, who was allowed me and, and, and uh, was willing to fight the battles on the administrative level among the leadership to say, let's allow Chris to do this. Uh, during the waning days of my fellowship, uh, I wrote a grant with uh, Dan Simon uh, and Marco Costa um, to, uh, and to work with uh, Moses Kamia, Charles Mondo, Emmy Okello, and others at the Uganda Heart Institute to, uh, and then uh, importantly you see here, Sissi Kitchio from the Joint Clinical Research Center to leverage existing HIV AIDS infrastructure here in Uganda to build a rheumatic heart disease treatment program. And this was a fairly large grant, um, which was, it was great to be able to have that experience of writing that grant with some very good and experienced mentors. Um, but I, there were a few other, this was in 2012, 
uh, we just had the idea for the project and we pitched it to this uh, philanthropy called Medtronic Foundation. Eventually that idea grew into a larger commitment from Medtronic Foundation of six million dollars over five years to other organizations around the world, including uh, Jonathan Karapetis here, who's a uh, uh, infectious disease, pediatric infectious disease, public health uh, doc in Australia, uh, and uh, Professor Bogani Mayosi from the University of Cape Town. Um, if some of you uh, knew him, um, recently actually passed away um, tragically an unexpected sudden, sudden death. Um, but uh, these were advocates for rheumatic heart disease globally and very, very important mentors to me uh, in teaching the lesson that uh, research, uh, and this is a, a talk about research mentorship, uh, research needs to do more than just answer scientific questions sometimes. An important component of research is, is conveying that message to the public and, and the value of, of uh, the public relations uh, campaign to promote your research so that your research is valued. And so that was a very important lesson uh, that I learned uh, from these mentors. I was able to write for a K Award, which is a career development award, with Grace McComsey as, as my mentor. That was a very important part to sustaining uh, the, the mentor relationship in my early career. And as part of that K Award, uh, was able to do a, 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 an experience at Harvard uh, where this guy, uh, uh, Ajay Singh, uh, was a, a very important uh, kind of career mentor in, in, in how do you navigate uh, the difficulties of uh, the political uh, uh, difficulties of having a career in academic medicine. So now as I'm kind of graduating, it's now 2018, uh, to what I would call my mid-career, uh, I am increasingly asked to take on leadership responsibilities and uh, I'm being put in positions where I, I am now becoming a mentor. So uh, this guy here is Marco Costa. He's been to Uganda probably three or four times to help do capacity building at the Uganda Heart Institute. He's now the president of our Heart and Vascular Institute. He asked me to uh, become the director of this research and innovation center, and I was very hesitant. Uh, I, you know, been focused on my research and, and was uh, worried that if I were to take on a leadership responsibility, that my research would suffer. And I think. Uh, a good mentor um, is someone who may push you to do things that you don't want to do sometimes. And I think Marco uh, did that. And, and, you know, again, maybe not only for the purposes of helping to grow the mentee, uh, but uh, in, 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 in this case, I think it was uh, a way to push me to, to build a skill set that I didn't have. <coughs> um, but I've also increasingly taken on residents and medical students to do projects using the data that I have gathered through, through the course of uh, my early career. And so uh, this is Ben Allen Cherry here, one of our internal medicine residents, uh, who has taught me a lot about uh, maybe some of the ways in which I, I uh, uh, may, may not be the best mentor. I don't think that it's because he tells me all the time or provides feedback, oh, you're not doing it right. Uh, but I can, I can feel it myself. Uh, and so I'll, I'll maybe share some of that in, in, in our discussion period. Um, but in particular, I think of uh, the fact that he sends me a draft of a uh, paper to review, and then it takes me you know, three or four weeks to review it, and I start to feel that guilt. You know, I haven't uh, been as uh, you know, good at getting back with him um, as I should be. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm learning, still learning very much to be a mentor. Um, I have finally successfully made that K to R transition, which is in, in NIH uh, language, uh, is getting my first successful uh, large NIH grant. Uh, and that is a project not involved here in Uganda, but in, back in Cleveland and at Duke University. And this is Hayden Bosworth, my co PI, um, who is much, much more senior than me. Um, but I think, uh, again, exemplifies many of the traits that I've, I've mentioned so far. Um, someone who's very, very gracious in sharing um, things uh, that he has from his prior research experience um, to help, help answer our, our mutual research questions together. 
So that's a little bit about my journey. And so hopefully, uh, you know, the, the purpose of that was primarily to just uh, show you that there are many, many traits of a good mentor, um, and there are potentially also traits of a good mentee. Uh, and so these next few slides are courtesy <coughs> of one of our uh, professors, Evie Stavrou, who is uh, an, uh, a basic scientist. So um, some of these may apply more to a basic science lab, uh, but I think many of them are, uh, are, are universal, really. Um, and so she's listed several uh, traits of a good men mentor. A good mentor is accessible, uh, has an open door uh, approach, and, and, and is always available. They are empathetic. Uh, they're able to understand when you, as the mentee, uh, are, are not doing well or what you, know, what you are experiencing. They need to be open-minded uh, and respectful of your individuality, consistent in acting on their stated principles on a regular basis, patient uh, and having the awareness that people make mistakes, obviously, and that each person uh, matures at his or her own, her own rate. Uh, they need to be honest and not only tell you the good things about what you're doing, but also the bad things uh, and how you need to improve. Uh, as a early mentor is still learning, that's very difficult for me uh, to tell a mentee you're not doing it very well. So I need to learn how to do that. Uh, <clears throat> they need to be savvy about uh, the pragmatic aspects of research uh, and career development. They can't just be kind of a a pie-in-the-sky scientist who's very cerebral and whatnot. Yeah, you need mentors who, um, who understand the pragmatic aspects of research. Um, you need to have someone who's trustworthy, who you can share about your past professional accomplishments and failures, as well as aspects of your personal life. Now, this may not be true about all of your mentors. You may not share all of your aspects of your personal life with all your mentors, but you may need one or two who you are able to uh, so that when problems uh, arise, you can talk through them with your mentor. So ideally, your mentor should be an advisor, a supporter, giving emotional and moral engagement, encouragement, a tutor, a sponsor. Again, thinking about Grace McComsey as my sponsor, who basically gave me opportunities, handed them to me on a plate. <coughs> need to be a model of identity, the kind of person that one envisions uh, and, and one aspires to be. Uh, so there are also traits of a good mentee. A good mentee should have foresight. Uh, and uh, it's really, really important that you start thinking five, three, five years down the road, and not just the immediate future, but think about uh, the more distant future as you plan your career. Um, you need to be proactive. Just like I said, I literally cold called or emailed Priscilla Shu and said, can I come work in your lab? You need to do that. Um, and you, you can't expect to be entirely taken care of. Uh, even though you may have mentors who hand you some things, um, you can't always be expecting that, um, or else you will be overlooked. Uh, you need to be respectful, you need to be polite. When you make an appointment to see somebody show up on time, uh, that's very important as a mentor uh, when someone comes uh, uh, late, or if they kind of hang around longer than the uh, uh, appointed time. Say we uh, scheduled a meeting for 30 minutes and they're still just kind of going on. And um, That's not the best in a mentee, right? Ideally, you would have a mentee who would come with a, an agenda uh, and say, here's my agenda, here's what we're gonna talk about today. And then uh, as a mentor, it's, it's easier to work with them. Um, to be thankful, as a mentee, it's, it's very important uh, that you thank your mentors uh, in, in a variety of ways um, and don't assume that they know how grateful you are. Um, and that you repay your mentor by indirectly helping others. Um, you need to be humble. Um, this is maybe more uh, in, in pertains to a lab, but um, if you are an MD or, or a, you know, a medical doctor who is working in a lab, may not have all the same knowledge as a PhD scientist, um, so you may be the initial weakest link, so you need to be humble and accept critical feedback. <clears throat> you need to be a team player. Even if you are uh, set in a project, you need to be aware of your, your lab members' struggles and, and helping them uh, as well. And then uh, you need to commit time. Uh, 
this, this is clearly uh, difficult for all of us to do, both as mentors and mentees, but critically important. Okay, so uh, just uh, in maybe the last minute or two, um, I thought I'd leave you with uh, some thoughts about balance. So being a good mentee and a good mentor and having a successful research career uh, is about balancing many, many things in life. So um, uh, I'm sure many of you deal with this. Uh, we deal with it very acutely uh, in the United States, and that is you cannot be a successful researcher unless you have protected time to do that research. If you're always being asked to do clinical medicine, or if you on your own accord are spending your time doing clinical medicine, or moonlighting, or that sort of thing, you're not going to be as successful. Now in the United States, uh, this is very much of a problem. To get protected time, you have to have research funding. And so that's where a mentor becomes important. And getting that protected research time and the funding uh, to do that is important. This is one of my mentors, uh, actually one who I didn't put up on the list, always says, even when it's not about the money, it's about the money. You have to be pragmatic and understand that eventually, if you don't have funding to do your research, you're going to be asked to do more clinical time. <clears throat> focus versus opportunity. Many people say, in order to be successful, you have to be focused. You have to drill down. You have to have a series of discoveries that build on one another, etc. Now, I think that that is absolutely true. Um, that if you're not focused, if you're just all over the place, you're never going to drive forward. But you also have to be willing to occasionally take a little detour. And so for me, that was this Medtronic Philanthropy Grant. I was very focused on HIV and cardiovascular disease. But Dan Simon came to me and said, we have this opportunity to write a grant for rheumatic heart disease. Why don't we do that? And, and I didn't really want to do it but it ended up being very valuable to me in many ways. So, so you have to balance focus and opportunity. Work versus life. So again, very, very important uh, that uh, you, know, you could be a successful researcher, uh, but destroy your, the rest of your life doing so. Uh, and I think that it's important for us as mentors, uh, even in my early mentoring days, uh, to support the family life of my mentees and to understand, you know, especially young parents, and I feel this very acutely, I have a, a two-year-old and a five-year-old daughter. Uh, I think that it's very important that we uh, support uh, mothers and fathers who are, are researchers. Um, and then to understand that you may have uh, goals as an individual and be able to succeed, succeed as an individual, uh, but uh, not, that should not be done at the exclusion of building relationships. And I think ultimately what I've discovered over the years is that uh, having a network is extremely valuable for advancing your career, uh, especially interdisciplinary bridges. So working in teams with nurses, uh, with uh, you know, uh, social workers, with social scientists, anthropologists, uh, can be very, very beneficial. So you may have mentors uh, who are not in your immediate discipline. <clears throat> okay, so I'll stop there.